welcome back. This is part 10 of the Jane Sutra's portion of Edward Reeb's Buddhist Books podcast. I think it's like episode 42 or 43 overall of, uh, of the podcast. Um, first, I'll say uh, if this is your first time seeing me, click here instead if you're on YouTube. That'll make sense. That's a link that'll take you to the whole playlist. Start with episode one, the beginning of the Dhammapada, and then you can kind of work your way up to this. Uh, if you're, you're here for the Jain Sutras, um, but this is your first of the Jain Sutras that you're looking at on this podcast, then click here instead. That'll take you to episode one of the Jain Sutras on the Buddhist Books podcast. And it'll explain why we're talking about Jain Sutras on a Buddhist Books podcast in the first place. Um, so I'll get right to it. Uh, today, first, it was all I could find. Hope that's okay. Um, gosh, where to start? Uh, in, in episode uh, seven, of Jain Sutras, I gave a. I started with a brief history of Andaman Islands, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, I should say. Andaman, by the way, I was saying Anduman because I was using Hanuman to as a as a mnemonic device to remember the name when I first heard it. Um, but I guess just to start with, I I hope you'll indulge me while I read you a poem that I wrote a couple of days ago. A shadow cast upon our souls, identified. 60,000 years, many more than the millennia of the Bering Strait pedestrians. Me, I was used to it, that feeling of not belonging where one is, of treading, deigning to have fun, joy, laughter, playfulness on the graves of those rightful owners if there were such a thing, of the land upon which I tread. That was old hat for me, as it is for those where I'm from with similar complexions, who can either own it, confront it, and feel guilty about it, and at least talk about voting were one to vote in favor of maybe trying to sort of help, or resist it, resent the guilt, claim God made it that way for their superior complexion or for his holy divine religion or civilization and, working in mysterious ways, used the necessary evil of one's murder-happy ancestors with their superior weapons, organization, and or measles blankets given as gifts. Or transcend, and I mean fucking seriously transcend, not some mind game, not some mouthing of words, not some trick. Actually dissociate from one's body, ancestors, language, and achieve unsurpassed, bright nirvana. Those are the three options available, generally speaking, for me and those like me. But for Priyal, it was different. It was her first time. In Bihar, she felt empowered by a thousand generations of her own ancestors. In Delhi, though the oppression of the former oppressors by the former oppressees is something we might say talk about voting against were we to vote, it's at least not something where sixty fucking thousand years of angry ghosts are focused on us and bringing us down. But here, in Andaman and Nicobar, that familiar feeling for me was unfamiliar for her. But then we were able to identify it. People leave food offerings for imaginary beings. The least we could do and all it seemed to take to come back into the light was to acknowledge them, to bow and respect, to read about them and feel bad, to allow the beauty to become permanently bittersweet. 
shallow ocean, warm and green, shells and hermit crabs playing, swimming, splashing, the sun reflecting, the wind blowing softly. And how many of them were here looking at these trees, those rocks, bathing in these same warm, shallow waters with that same breeze. We acknowledge you. We see you. We feel bad about what happened when the Indians came a thousand years ago. Then the Danes, then the Brits, back to the Indians. With tears and more to say still, I'll let you fill in the rest and end this poem. Now, in that episode, uh, you remember I had said others throughout the uh, centuries since then have, uh, have, have taken ownership of, you know, the usual suspects, the Portuguese, the Dutch, I don't know exactly in what order it went through the imperialists, but it ended up in the hands of the British. Now, I was right about one thing there. I did not know the order in which it was handed from imperialist to imperialist. It turns out it all started a thousand years ago when India conquered Andaman and Nicobar Islands and set up a naval base here to use in an effort to conquer present-day Indonesia. So here's uh, done a bit more research since uh, episode seven. So I'll lay it out for you and then we'll get to today's reading. We'll get back to the Jain Sutras. The, uh, the earliest settlers of these islands came approximately 65,000 years ago, and they were among the first humans, modern humans, to, you know, modern in the sense of same DNA as us, basically, uh, to leave Africa and uh, go out into the rest of the world. And they may very well have just walked across some ice to get here, because, as you may know, we're in the middle of an ice age. Some put it that that ice age ended, but it's we're actually kind of in a lull in the middle of it. You can tell by the ice in Antarctica and the ice in uh, the Arctic that this is uh, what you would call an ice age. The, uh, the Earth is normally much warmer than this. Um, for the past 25,000 years or so, it's uh, thawed out enough that we can, you know, come outside, stop huddling around the fire. Uh, anyway, so, so yeah, so those people settled here um, and they're still here. They've been here ever since. Um, the Sentinelese, what is presently known as the Sentinelese, the Jarawa, the Onga, and the Great Andamanese are among those descendants of these original settlers, um, which before outsiders came would have been considered still in the early Paleolithic period. Uh, you know, basically a remnant of the early Paleolithic period. If you've read The Land That Time Forgot, it's basically still there. It's, it's basically our ancestors if we could talk to our most ancient ancestors from tens and tens and tens of thousands of years ago, they're here. Um, and then the Chompen and the Nicobaris are two other tribes that settled here, you know, only a few tens of thousands of years ago. Still a long time ago, right? They're more kind of on par with how long the First Nations have been in what we now call the Americas. Uh, many of them were and still are uh, what could be called animistic monotheists. Whoa, what? That's two words you wouldn't think would go together in a sentence. Animism is usually uh, thought of as like pre-shamanic, although there's some overlap with shamanic, and then it goes into you know other other types of mo of polytheism, and then eventually, in the case of you know Western religions, evolves 
you might say, or changes into monotheism. But there is a, maybe because it's such a small grouping of islands, there's 500 islands, 27 of which are inhabited. The others are just very small. Um, but anyhow, they uh, believe in a single god called Paluga, or Palaga, I'm not sure, Puluga, one of those, surely, uh, who is responsible for everything, creation of the earth, the maintenance of everything, not a blade of grass moves without his, uh, his will. And he used to live at the top of the highest peak of the islands, uh, Saddle Peak, but you know, as things have changed in recent times, he now lives higher up. So if you ask the, the native people, they'd say he lives higher up in the sky, but he used to live at that uh, top of that highest peak. Now, the, the people referred to as Sentinelese are the ones who I mentioned in episode seven who currently live on North Sentinel Island. And of course, Sentinel is not an ancient word. It's you know, more of an English word, and so that's the origin of the uh, term Sentinelese. And uh, yeah, you heard me mention those. They're um, presently, as of, they, they can protect themselves pretty damn well, but as of 1956, they're also under the protection of the Indian government, uh, who recognize the preciousness of this last of the early Paleolithic humanity. Um, the, the estimates are, the, the estimates vary from 100 and 500 uh, population of, of those who remain on that island of that tribe. Now, the other tribes include the Great Andamanese. Now, uh, on, Andamanese, of course, Andaman Islands, Andamanese. Um, now, when the British first came 300 years ago, there were between 2,000 and 6,000. And in present day, there are about 52 left. Um, they were and are divided up into 10 tribes. The Kari, who at last count, there were two individuals left. The Kora, who are no longer with us. The Bo, of which there are 15 individuals at last count. The Jeru, of which there are 19 remaining. And then on the, that's in the northern uh, side. And then the southern side, there's uh, the Kede, who as of 1931 are no longer with us. The Kol, who as of 1921 are no longer with us. The Juwoi, who are no longer with us as of 1931. The Pukekwar, uh, who are also no longer with us. The Bale, also no longer with us, and the uh, Bay from the coast of South Andaman and Rutland Island are no longer with us. Um, the Onga, uh, last count, there were 672, but that was 1901, and I wasn't able to find uh, anything more recent than that. So there are, are presumably some of them remaining. Uh, the Chopin, you remember those were the ones who weren't quite 65,000 years ago, more like, you know, only 20,000 years ago they came, or, or thereabouts, maybe 10. I'm not sure about that, actually. Wasn't able to find information about that. I'm sure it's out there. I just didn't uh, try hard enough. They're um, on the western side. They call themselves the Kele, the Chopin. That's not their name for themselves. Someone else gave them that name. Um, and there are approximately 300 of them left. The Nicobaris, of course, are um, on Nicobar, the other islands. Um, and they are traditionally headed by a matriarchal chief. So they're matriarchal, that's interesting, right? And uh, many of them were converted to Christianity by a man named John. I didn't bother to write down his last name. And, uh, but some of them do still practice the ancient uh, animism of their, of their ancestors. Men and women have equal status and it's the women who choose their husbands. And uh, of the Chopin, there are four groups, the Kar, the Chaura, 
the uh, Nan Kauri, and then the Sambelong or Southern Nicobarese. I'll try to move more quickly so we can get to at least some of today's reading uh, and still keep this at around half an hour. So uh, the early palm leaf Tamil inscriptions that kept copious records back then in Tamil refer to these islands as Tanjavur, or uh, excuse me, they refer to them as Timai Tati Vugal, which means the islands of evil, right? I mean, you know, if you confront your ancient ancestors from 60,000 years ago, you know, and maybe don't get along with them, then, uh, you know, maybe that's what you would call them. Um, the Chinese had a similar name for them in uh, around 600. They referred to them as the land of demons or ogres. Marco Polo was about as uh, kind. He, he said they, they had the faces of dogs. And then people in Europe, you know, drew the, painted these fanciful paintings of people literally with dog heads like Anubis. You know, imagining that that's what they were like, except with like blue and pink silk robes and stuff like that. It was very weird. Anyway. So in around uh, 1000, the Chola dynasty, now that's not to be confused with the slang term for that is in use in uh, Latin America or at least in Los Angeles. Anyway, uh, no, it's a it's a pun. It's a, a, in the sense of it's a it's a homonym. Same spelling, presumably similar pronunciation, different linguistic origin, entirely different meaning. That's a classic pun. Anyway, um, so yeah. The, the Chola dynasty, over the course of a long time, they got into, they, you know, had a good trade spot. They were right at the bottom of India, so they, they gradually started taking over more and more of that region and then up into northeastern India, what we now call northeastern India, and they took over Sri Lanka. And then, um, but there was another powerful empire that was based in Indonesia and they had taken over a number of islands and they were kind of dominating the what we now call the South China Seas, which is a huge, back then, a, a huge trade, it still is a huge, uh, you know, trading web, you know, boats coming in and out a lot more today, but back then a lot. Uh, so all the spices, all the gold, you name it, everything was going through there. So the Chola dynasty wanted uh, wanted to have that. They wanted to dominate that, and so they decided to attack present-day Indonesia. And uh, kind of on their way to do that, they conquered Andaman and Nicobar and established a naval port here. So the naval port that's here today, um, the kind of in spirit, was established back then, basically. Now, that's a little bit of an oversimplification because it fell into disuse, of course, over the centuries, and then later the British established separately a naval port, and then kind of the remains of that became what is now the naval port um, that is used by uh, the Republic of India. So, But it was interesting. I did make an assumption, um, you know, that it was, quote-unquote, the usual suspects, the... Uh, the Portuguese, the, the Dutch, but it was none of the above. It was uh, the South Indians. Now, back then, there wasn't this idea of India as a unified whole, um, much the same way that, you know, a couple hundred years ago, there wasn't this idea of the United States of America. If you ask someone in California, are you from the same country as New York? They say, hell no. Um, and same with Texas and so on. But, you know, then over time, it became this this shared identity with a shared name and a shared flag. In a similar way, um, it's also a little bit of an oversimplification and an anachronism to say that quote-unquote India conquered um, Andaman and Nicobar. Although the uh, the dynasty and the geographic you know location, which is Tamil Nadu, so uh, the ancestors of our friend Navi, who if you're a long-time viewer of this and other podcasts you've met, um, She's a good friend of ours, sister, sister from another mister of uh, my wife. Anyway, um, so yeah, so that was that was what got, got the ball rolling, and I'll I'll run through the rest relatively quickly because yeah, it's not that important. The uh, the Danes came along in the 1700s and established New Denmark. They they renamed these islands New Denmark, and then uh, then malaria came, or no, then the British came, and. Uh, 
and then malaria came. And uh, a lot of people died, of course, around the world, and uh, you know, a lot of the native people of these islands as well. Um, the population was estimated to have been cut in half at that time. Um, then in 1859, there was a big famous battle called the Battle of Aberdeen between the great Andamanese and the British. Can you guess who won? And uh, then the, uh, the colony, the British colony here remained until the Japanese started bombing in 1942, at which point the British just got the hell out of here. And all that remained here were the native people and the hundreds of thousands of, I, think, I believe at that time, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Indians that resided here. And uh, the British by then had established a penal colony here. So anybody in the 1700s who dared to go against the British East India Company um, were imprisoned here. So that's fun. Oh, by the way, the, uh, it was the Danish East India Company. They just kept calling things, you know, the Dutch East India Company, the Danish East India Company. They weren't very clever with their naming of corporations back then. Um, so, so this was under Japanese occupation for three years, uh, from 42 to 45, and then they left, you know, you know, right? Uh, anyway, so it went back to the British, uh, and of course, uh, back then, India was still British, you know, uh, considered. And so anyway, then later, when, um, uh, Indian independence was coming around. And as I mentioned in episode seven, because of that clever boy at Cambridge University, uh, the British started drawing lines. Now there was, uh, back then, West Pakistan. Not a lot of people know this. Even in India, some people don't have this little bit of information. Back then there was West Pakistan and then there was East Pakistan. East Pakistan, through a series of unfortunate events or a series of events that I'm not like entirely aware of, became uh, Bangladesh. So that's what happened there. So in the midst of all that, uh, the people that were going to be becoming the uh, government of Pakistan were saying, okay, well, we get it on and Nicobar, right? And the British were like, yeah, of course, that sounds fair. It's geographically near East Pakistan. <clears throat> but um, then Prime Minister Nehru, um, again, longtime followers of this and other podcasts might be aware of Nehru Place, which is uh, a place where I like to go to the Starbucks because there's a nice little park in between where I live and Nehru Place. So anyway, um, uh, Sri Nehru, I have his full name written out somewhere, but I'm not finding it right now. So I'm just going to keep moving along. Pointed out that at that time, or in the census of 1941, there was a population of 34,000. So not hundreds of thousands of Indians, but there were thousands of Indians living here. And when the British pulled out, um, the, that uh, 12,000 of them were Hindus, Sikhs, and Buddhists. 11,000 were the Aboriginal tribes at that time. And uh, 8,000 were Muslim. And so the British said, oh, okay, you know, so that'll be part of India. And then, of course, as I mentioned, there was that period where Britain was like, oh, no, we're going to keep it and we're going to make a new country that's going to be, you know, the, the mixed couples. Um, so that's weird. <sighs> so uh, since 1956, uh, the government of India has ma been making a concerted effort to uh, help the tribes to survive and thrive and live in the manner that they're accustomed to, um, you know, with regions set aside for them. <clears throat> One might make a comparison to the reservations of the U.S., but uh, it is what it is. They, uh, they seem to be doing their best to help. As I mentioned, they're protecting North Sentinel Island um, insofar as it needs protecting. Uh, though there was that Christian missionary that got through and that we mentioned the other day. Sorry to be smiling about that to the people who are horrified by what happened. It's just in the overall context of history, I find it a little bit, I hate to say funny. Why do I find it funny? Because I'm terrible. I'm a terrible person. I'm not a good person, not a good Buddhist, not a good JNS, and I'm just not a good soul to be smiling about that guy getting murdered. Anyway, <laughs> right? Or are you smiling too? Maybe, maybe you're like me. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe you're just horrified by my reaction to that. 
Um, anything else? Yes. Uh, well, there was a period of time where there were these quote unquote human safaris, which is, you know, not like a, not an endorsed thing. It was a phenomenon that was happening where there was a road that went through the region where the, the native people, not, not the North Sentinelese, but the, uh, the Andamanese, I believe, were, had been relocated or the ones that start with a J. Um, well, anyway. And you know, they, they're living in their usual early Stone Age manner, <clears throat> and tourists were gawking, looking out the window and taking pictures and stuff like that. So that was banned outright. And uh, some people still try to go down that road and uh, gawk at uh, the people who live there. And uh, it's highly discouraged. Don't do it. So that's the more complete story of these islands. And uh, I used up most of our time, didn't we? How can I really call this episode 10 of uh, Jane Sutra's on the Buddhist Books podcast without reading for a few minutes at least? So, picking up right where we left off last time, you remember we were talking about the uh, ninefold chastity. The next section here is the renunciation of the four passions, another list. Okay, let's shift gears, shall we? Move from from Andaman to a different uh, ancient people, the ancient people of Bihar and their uh, native religion that predated Hinduism, apparently. The primary cause of karmic bondage is passions or kasaya. The root of kasaya is kasa, which means the world, and aya, which means profit. This kind of ties into what we were just talking about, doesn't it? It kind of shows, uh, you know, the evils of uh, trying to trying to make a worldly profit and how it kind of leads one to be an imperialist asshole who conquers and uh, destroys other cultures, right? It's interesting. My dad used to talk about what cultural adolescence abounds in uh, Western Europe and kind of from a certain point of view, you know, India already did that. He can kind of sit back with a thousand years of having, you remember a thousand years ago when we thought it was a good idea to try to conquer a bunch of places so that we could dominate the trade routes and get all the gold. <laughs> Gosh, what children we were back then. Oh, look, the Dutch are doing it now. Oh, look, the Portuguese and the Spanish. Oh, now the British. Are, oh, shit, they're over here now, you know. <clears throat> Sometimes the, the older ones have to tolerate the youngsters and but they know what they're up to because of course they did it when they were their age anyway that was how my dad saw things uh <clears throat> therefore that which gives rise to profit or gain in the material world and increases the cycles of birth and death is kasaya so we don't like kasaya i'm right on board with this one i'm not sure about the chastity one but i can understand why they were talking about it but this these four passions. Yeah, I'm 100% on board with this aspect of uh, Jainism so far. There are four main types of Kasaya. One, anger. <laughs> or Grod, Krod, K R O D H, Krod, Krod, Crud, Crud, you know, Krod. Anger destroys love. It can be overcome by forgiveness. Yeah, no, there's your answer. It's a simple thing. Just forgive. That doesn't mean let them walk all over you. That doesn't mean unblock them on Facebook. That doesn't mean answer their calls. It doesn't mean forget. But forgive. It's for you. Because anger is a poison that slowly kills you. It doesn't hurt them doesn't do a damn thing to them. Now, <clears throat> if you're organizing a revolution, of course, you want to get people as angry as possible, blah, 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 bullshit. I think there's a better way to do it. And I know that a lot of wise ones say, well, you know, don't knock down what, what what's working for us until you have a better solution. So I apologize, I don't have a better solution. I thought the army of hackers was going to save everybody, but I was wrong. Two, pride. This is the number two type of kasaya. 
And remember, uh, that's the uh, what gives rise to profit or gain in the material world and increases the cycles of birth and death. Pride. Pride destroys modesty. It can be overcome by humility. Okay. Number three. <clears throat> Deceit or Maya. <laughs> I asked someone recently, uh, I forget who, is there anything to the fact that the Buddha's mother's name was Maya? And he was like, no, no, no connection whatsoever. Not the same thing. I was like, yeah, I didn't think so. You remember in an earlier episode, I said that that's as ridiculous as thinking uh, can, as in I can do it, has something to do with cans, where you can things, and therefore Napoleon, because it was, never mind. Deceit or Maya. Deceit means to cheat. It destroys friendship. It can be overcome by simplicity. Yeah. A tangled web we weave when we set out to deceive, right? So you have to remember not only reality, you have to remember your lie, <clears throat> and then all the lies you have to tell to uphold that lie, so you end up with this very complex, you know, if A, C, 12, and if B, C, 23, you know, that kind of thing. Simplicity. Simplicity. Truth is truth. Four. The number four type of kasaya is greed, or lobha. <clears throat> this is the most dangerous passion of all. It can lead to conquering these islands, for one. It can destroy all qualities. It can be overcome by contentment. Santosh, right? I remember that one from the Yamas and the Yamas. It can be overcome by contentment. Be content. That overcomes greed. Now all that little chatter, little, how does it, you know, if I'm one person and there's eight billion people and me not being greed, me being content, how's that going to help end all the atrocities in the world? You really want to be greedy that bad? You really want to be uh, doomed forever to go around like this? If you're free, that doesn't mean you have to leave. It also doesn't mean you have to come back as a bodhisattva, in my humble opinion. Or as I recently coined a term, I haven't announced it to the world yet, in my arrogant asshole opinion. You can just come back if you want to. My dad calls it being a journeyer, as opposed to a flesh place fear junkie. But if you are attached to the greed, you just want to live in a palace. If you're attached to the lust, you can't live without it. If you're attached to the anger, to the pride, to the fear, even if it's upside down, you're attached to, you know, then you're bound to come back again and again if you buy the whole reincarnation thing. Otherwise, it doesn't mean that these teachings are irrelevant. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, I have a good friend who's an atheist and thinks the lights go out at the point of death, and that's it. And he's a devout Theravada Buddhist because he believes that that is the way to find happiness while he's alive in this one life. So that's today's episode. I thank you for, uh, for being here for it. And I would like to call upon the name of Jara, ja, uh, excuse me, not, not Jarawa. Who was it? Paluga, I would like to, if we may, diverge a little bit from the usual Buddhism, Jainism. Thank you, Paluga, for allowing me to be present here in your land. May, may you smile upon your people. 
the tribes of these lands. And if there's enough of a smile left over, may you also smile upon us. Thank you. I'll close with the prayer that my father taught me when I was very young. To the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us, and to the spirits below, we send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace. Thank you for going on this ride with me. Until next time.